My name is Chris. I am uh, a Haskell user. I used to use Clojure and uh, Common Lisp. And I wanted to show how I was able to work in Haskell and get the same or better interactive workflow in Haskell um, with a REPL, with uh, integration in Emacs. And uh, just wanted to share a little bit of my workflow as I squash a couple of things I need to do with the library I've been working on. The library is Bloodhound. It's a client for Elasticsearch. Um, it's as much about having a way to talk to Elasticsearch in Haskell as it is having an explicit and well-typed scaffolding for talking to Elasticsearch because it's not just about using Haskell. There just wasn't really a good spec for the different kinds of search uh, searches you can perform in Elasticsearch. They're, they have a lot of functionality and it's really nice, but there's a lot of stuff flying around and uh, keeping track of all that and programmatically generating queries can be very error prone. So I went ahead and I, I fired up my REPL. Um, I'm going to show you how I did this again. So you manage your projects in Haskell with Cabal, it's it performs a similar function as Clojure's Linigan, um, Java's Maven, kind of. Maven covers a little bit more responsibility than Cabal. Um, Linigan's a closer example. Uh, Nodes NPM, things like that, but it, it's really closest to Linigan. It, uh, it doesn't really do the package management, uh, technically GHC, which is the standard Haskell compiler that most people use. Um, that technically handles the package management. What Cabal does is it handles the dependencies and it manages your project. Um, you use Cabal to fire up your REPL so that it automatically handles using the package DB with all your dependencies and everything you're using, including your own code, and makes those available to you in the REPL. So when I fire it up, it's loading my different dependencies I'm using, semi-groups, scientific, conduit, and uh, it starts compiling my code as well. So uh, the REPL is, is Cabal REPL. It's just GHCI. And GHCI isn't quite the same as Clojure's REPL. It, instead, of, instead of being a resident compiler, it's actually a, an interpreter. Um, so it's a, it's a little bit more similar to a Lisp in that respect. Um, when it goes to compile my code, I have in my Cabal file, I have some GAC options enabled, um, specifically relating to warnings. Uh, so I have wall turned on, and you always want wall. You, you always want to have it enabled, at least on like a, you know, a serious project, uh, whether it be a library or an application. Um, GHC's wall will catch a lot of stuff for you that the type system does not. And uh, yeah, you want to take advantage of that. And then um, I, I, I shot off a couple of warnings, uh, one about unused bindings, another about uh, orphans. I'm probably going to get rid of the unused bindings uh, because I had HLint warn me about some unused bindings. And uh, it was right. I was making a mistake. I boned up. So uh, lesson learned. Don't ignore the warnings. Really, don't. They, they're always telling you something. And uh, that was a warning, those warnings I'm talking about that ended up being right that I should have fixed, I ignored those for multiple weeks. I can't imagine what I would have done if that had been in an untyped language that didn't warn me about stuff like that. Anyway, so uh, we've got a couple, we've got a couple of warnings. Um, let's just go ahead and take care of the, the quickie one first. It says that instances at line 147 Binding is getting shadowed or whatever. Okay, so we're gonna go to instances 147. Okay, so we're shadowing the binding here. Um, this is easy enough to fix. Hopefully, there's nothing in that already. Okay, so next up is um, it's telling me I've got a non-exhaustive pattern match. Um, to explain that, so. This is a type class instance for 2JSON. Uh, 2JSON is basically the primary functionality 
that this library provides because it exposes these uh, these abstract data types, which I'll show you. Look at term query. There we go. So there's a term, term query. Yeah. So a term query is just um, it's just a term, and maybe it has boost. Uh, it'll it'll default to boost if not. So okay, that's fine. Um, you construct the term query when you're actually using this library, just you know, like a normal data type. You know, when you think about it. Now, what it's complaining about is that basically a type class here, this instance, it has to pattern match on all of these these possibilities because it's one big sum type, and I'm using the sum type to encode the fact that you know your query object might be this, or this, or this, or this. It could be any of those. So all of these are valid query objects. So in order for me to properly handle um, the uh, touching any, any object of type query, if I'm going to start pattern matching specific ones, I need to either default the pattern match, or I need to handle all of them. Right? unless I want a partial function. So basically, my type class instance is a partial function because it's not pattern matching all of them. Incidentally, partial functions are one of the places, there's not many, but it's one of the places where you get a runtime error uh, in Haskell. An example of a partial function would be head, the default head in Prelude. Incidentally, that's why I tell people to A, not really lean on Prelude that much if, it, if they're pretty worried about a runtime error, and B, don't use head. Just pattern match the list, seriously. Because if you pattern match the list, you have the option of defaulting the empty list case. But if you use head, you don't. Now it's fine if it has something in it, but you just don't want to go there if you can help it. Okay, so it was complaining before about these two patterns not getting matched. Query simple, query string query, and query regex query. Um, okay, fine. So let's look at this one. Yeah, that's the one it wants. Okay. So basically, we just need to implement it. Um, I'm just going to go to the bottom, get it started. And the next thing I'm going to do, I'm doing this off screen, but I'm going to bring it up, is I'm going to bring up the documentation in Elasticsearch for how this, uh, how this is exactly supposed to work. So if you go to their documentation, what you really want is you want their, uh, their query DSL, which is split up into two categories, you have queries and filters. And this regex query. Okay. Alright, so this is what a regex query looks like. Um, we're not we're not really gonna encode this version because it's limited and it only supports setting the value. Um, you can we'll we'll do the equivalent, but but we're gonna structure it where you can have multiple fields, like these two examples. Um, Okay, so what we need to do is we need to do regexp, and then that's going to be set to to JSON of the query object. So the reason I'm doing it this way is the way the sum type works in most places here is there's a separate type, and that separate type is this is just another type. Um, and then so is this. Whereas this this guy, you're not really going to have a separate two JSON instance. Um, you, well, you might for term, and you might for boost, but you still need to break out the whole thing in the instance for term query. But for regexp query, I don't really have to. So what's going to happen is is basically 
query regexp query is only going to encode this part right here. That part. And then regexp query is going to be responsible. I should be the one I'm actually going to follow. There we go. Regexp query is going to be responsible for this. So this wraps this. This wraps this. This is the basic pattern I've been using for encoding JSON and Bloodhound. Um, okay, so with that in mind, we need to start an instance here. Yep, okay. And here, GHC mod caught a type error. I didn't even ask for it or anything, it just it, it found the type error. Uh, what's happening here is my Emacs has GAC mod integration enabled, and you can see these daemons here running. Um, it's a persistent service that talks to Emacs. And what it's doing is I think every time you save, I want to say, it, uh, it queries the state of your file. And what GAC mod does is it picks up on your Cabal project, it uses all your dependencies and everything, so your stuff actually is supposed to compile. And it finds type errors as you're working on your code, just more or less like what you would expect with, say, like Eclipse or, or IntelliJ or something like that if you're working on Java. Um, it's not too different in that respect, and except you get to use an editor you like, in my case, Emacs. Uh, Vim has GAC mod integration as well, and from what I recall, it's pretty good. So if I hover over this error, um, and, I, and I'll see the same error if I reload my code in the REPL. In fact, you know what, why don't I? Here. I'm just going to ignore that for now. OK, cool. So we have a type error. Um, I didn't have to rely on the GC mod integration. I can just interact. So colon R is short for reload, I'm pretty sure. I always do, yeah, OK. So I always do the R, so I don't, I don't always remember what the full names of things are. Um, okay, so the type error, no instance for 2JSON regexp query arising from use of 2JSON. Okay, so we tried to, we tried to call 2JSON on a type that has no implementation of 2JSON. So we need to implement that, that type class, we need to instance that type class for that type before that's not a type error, right? So another, another place where um, this is something I, I really like because even if you know that you're going to go implement the instance, if you want to hammer out a bunch, uh, a chunk of the API that creates the need for a bunch of instances, you can basically use this as like a checklist of things you need to do before your code's going to work. Um, that pattern of working I really like because in Clojure, when I would implement things like protocols so that I didn't forget anything, I or for that matter, write it, have to write a bunch of tests testing each protocol instance. Um, I would have to, the moment I created the need for a protocol, I would have to turn around and go implement the instance of that protocol for that type immediately, or I might forget something. And that, that's, that's a bit frustrating. I don't want to have to do that. So we're going to implement our, our, uh, our instance for this. And just to be explicit, like this is the regexp query that's contained and that we're calling to JSON that's creating the need for this, so that type. All right, what does that type look like? Well, if we just scroll down, oh, it's right there. How convenient. Okay, so we have a registry query. Um, it has a few components to it. It has a field name, the actual regex, regex flags, cache name, cache, and cache key. So to explain the caching stuff, uh, normally caching in Elasticsearch is something you just kind of flip on or off. But in the case of regexp query, it actually lets you uh, a enable or disable the cache, and b it um, it lets you decide what the cache should be named and how it should be keyed, and that basically lets you um, more granularly decide how you split out the caching behavior and who should share the same cache slot or not. Um, I haven't actually come up with a need for this. I'm sure that if I did more regex that had common structure or just identical regex, I would care more about that, but it's not terribly common for me. Most of the regex queries that I perform with an input generated, I don't know how much caching would help me there. Anyway, so we get, uh, we get this 
this started. And basically the, the pattern here is we only have one type class method to implement. In this case it's just to JSON. And then we're gonna we're gonna pattern match our uh, our objects here, our data type. And it's a record, we're using standard record syntax, so this is a, a product type. Um, it's a product of six fields, and I think most of them are fairly basic direct objects. I think most of them are new types actually. So let's let's get an idea of what field name is. So field name actually I should yeah, it's a field name. There we go. So field name, for example, is just text. That's all. It's just a wrapper for the text type. Um, the reason we have the new type here is A for type safety, uh, B for explicitness, so that our our types on our functions don't look like stuff like that. Because that sucks. That doesn't tell you anything. But if you saw a field name to regexp to regexp flags to regexp query, then you actually know what the type's telling you. It's telling you if you could be this a field name, a regular expression, and flags, I'll give you a regex query. Right? So it's a little bit easier to understand makes the API nicer. Um, we're going to I'm gonna blow this up and because I want to be able to see the fields as I match on them here. If you're wondering what that window popping up is, um, I inadvisedly messed with my uh, Emacs config last night and didn't clean up what I was doing, so it's a little bit broken right now. But that's okay. I think that's going to slow me down too much. I thought it was a little bit annoying. And what I'm doing here is I'm just going down the list. Matching the fields so that they'll be in the scope when I go to create the JSON. Okay, there we go. And you can you can see a similar pattern here um, with this. So it's, it's the same idea. It's just more fields. Okay, so I've been using this uh, this pattern, which I should probably explain at some point, but won't work now. Where I have an object and I've been shoving out the non-determinism of the maybe fields out to something that I cap maybes with an M field and then I just I just concatenate it with the stuff that isn't uncertain which in this case would be query because we're always going to have a QS query string why do we know that? because it's not maybe um, so given that I, I use cap maybes basically as a nice way to to discard anything that's nothing, essentially. Um, it's it's a pattern that's working for me. Um, I would like to validate it with somebody who is more experienced than I am. Okay, so we've got our, our objects here, but what are we supposed to implement? Well, it's supposed to look like this, right? Okay, so we know that we're gonna have something like that, but that's that's actually the field. So we don't actually want to set that statically. Um, it's just gonna be the query field, but since it's a field name, what we actually want to do is destructure the text inside. And then that way we have access to the actual text object. Um, and I just saved, which caused it to reach type check the code. It's complete about a parse error because I started my brackets here. Not a big deal. Okay, I just wanted to make certain that doing this was kosher. All right, so we have a regex p query field. And if I if I had not done this destructuring, 
this wouldn't have uh, worked unless I did something like that. But basically, field name is not a valid text, and objects in ESON, which is the JSON encoding library I'm using, it, it expects the keys of the object to be text. So, can't do that. But if I destructure the field, the text object inside the field name, then I can do that. It's no problem at all. Okay, so um, I've got a few fields here. I'm going to break this out a little bit. There's that again. I break my habit when I hit tab. Okay, so contents equals what's contents? Well, it's get a value. It's something. Where's cash in there? Hmm. Suspicious. It might be that I added cash name, cash, and cash key when in fact it's only available for filters, specifically regex filter. And that explains why I was confused by the idea of cache in a query, actually. Because normally you can't cache great. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this isn't a thing. Alright, cool. So, I get to fix a problem. Um, these don't exist. So, the only thing we need to add is, it mentioned boost. We already have flags. So, I'm just going to add that. speed, boost, and then we they don't really necessarily need boost every time. So I'm gonna encode the fact that sometimes I'm not gonna bother. Alright, so that means we can make this. Let's see if that Mm. So, okay, it's saying that it's getting a list of key value pairs when it expects a ESOM value object. Value is the big sum type that encodes all of the different things JSON can be. It encodes objects, um, arrays, primitives like number and string. Um, it's complaining that we have a list of pairs instead of uh, instead of an actual ESOM value object. Because what 2JSON is supposed to return is that sum type, not a list of pairs. You see how I use the object function here? It's it's a constructor for taking the list of pairs and turning it into a value. So I just need to do that. There we go. And then Okay. Cool. So it's just complaining about the fact that it's undefined here. <laughs> In the types and figures. So value is just HXP, query, query. Um, the actual type is that. That is HXP, okay. 
Let's see. Let's see. I want to see if uh, regexp already has a 2JSON instance. Regexp flags does. The regexp query does not. So let's find the new type of regexp. Okay, so regexp doesn't have a 2JSON instance, so I'm going to handle it the same way I did field name. I'm just going to destructure it, which could be the text object, which means I can just embed it directly. I don't have to do anything special. Okay, and then regexp query flags does have a 2JSON instance, so I'm just going to take advantage of that. And it is something you want to take advantage of because there's some um, there's a bunch of stuff that encodes related to different possible flags. You don't want to bother with that. Okay, so we've got one thing here. Um, we've got a maybe object. Uh, our boost isn't guaranteed to be to exist. How do we know that? Well, get regexp query. You see, maybe boost. Okay, so. This means that I get to demonstrate the trick I was talking about. So we're going to rename this to conjoin base. Remove that entirely. And then we're going to add something new here. And this is going to be mfuel boost. What I really should do is I should uh, refactor this so that I just have a list of tuples, and then it just you know maps this, calls that, and returns it. And I could even make a video of that, but kind of boring. Not kind of, really boring. Okay, so I've got basically two different tranches of, of fields that I'm going to add to this final JSON object. One is base. Um, base is the stuff that's guaranteed to exist. It doesn't have some kind of uncertainty associated with it. And then maybe add is the, you know, we don't know if we're going to get this, but I don't really want to have two huge pattern matches in my type class instance. Um, if you ever talk to a Haskeller and they say that you don't really have to pattern match everything, this is the kind of program that we're talking about. Really, functions get it done. You don't have to pattern match everything. Okay. So, although sometimes pattern matching is nicer than the actual move, or clear, in fact. But if you've got a really common pattern like this, it's worth abstracting. Okay, so what are we going to do with conjoined? Well, it's kind of the same story as this. Um, so we're going to concatenate it, but before we do that, we need to not have a list of maybes. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to cat. Uh, whoops, we're going to cat maybes. Uh, maybe out. If you're wondering what cat maybes are. It is. Oh, uh, hold on, I've got a type in. I'll show you. This is there we go. Okay, we're back to warnings again, which is good. Because uh, warnings mean we look the code. Uh, so we've got new warnings because I'm shadowing some bindings, but I wanna I wanna address cat menus real quick. Okay, so we'll just import it. Okay, so what makes cat maybe nice is that you can have a list of things that might or might not exist, and it'll keep only the just objects out of it. So I can have just one, nothing, and then I can cat maybe that, and I get just the just the one. It drops the nothing. Um, kind of uh, almost the opposite of cat maybe is a sequence. Um, sequence re returns, I should the type. So it, what sequence does is it, you have a list of monadic objects, it lifts the monad outside of the list. So what that means when your monad is maybe is that you're applying the non-determinism of any one object not existing to, you're changing it to having applied to the entire list. So I'll get my I'll get a list back just one and two if I have no nothings inside there. But if I have nothing, even though I had some data in there, it short circuits. But if you want the partial data, then use cat maybe's. Um, 
Now, the reason you're allowed to do cat maybes, because normally you can't just make a maybe disappear. That's normally not allowed. Um, basically what you're doing is you're allowing the empty list case to stand in for the uncertainty that the maybes are encoding. And the reason it's able to stand in for that uncertainty is that you're taking whatever is there, whatever is you know wrapped in just, you're keeping that, you're dropping the nothings. But if you have a list of nothings, then cat maybe is just gonna give you the empty list. So whenever you handle whenever you handle a list in Haskell, you have to well you don't have to, but generally you, you need to handle the empty list case. Now doing stuff like F mapping. Ignore these warnings. I don't know where they come from. Um, F mapping over an empty list isn't going to break anything, but if you, again, if you do head, that's an exception, right? So, okay. Um, you're, you're basically trading non determinism, or you're, you are squishing it down, because the empty list case existed regardless, as demonstrated by that. But cat maybe just kicks the empty list back out. So that that uncertainty was going to exist regardless, but it didn't have to. Or rather, it, it wasn't the only one. By using cat maybes, you're eliminating the maybe uncertainty, and then you only have the empty list uncertainty. Okay, so... That's why I do cat maybes, because I can't put... Or rather, I don't want to put a list of maybe things into the JSON object. Anything that's nothing, I basically just want the field to be unset on the object, and I want Elasticsearch to default it for me. So let's let's test this. Um, What's the field name? What am I regexing? Flags. Flags. Okay. Okay, and then when well, we need the actual right to speak clear. And you can um you can have the REPL running in your Emacs. I don't because I'm a Philistine. Um, but you can. It's up to you. Um, that's my address for query. Just done query. And then, uh, nothing. Oh, boost. Okay. No. Okay. That was right. Oh, whoops. Yeah, okay. There we go. Ah. Alright, so boost is nothing. Field name. Alright, so now we want to know what happens if we encode it. Cool, looks good. So we have an object birthday, and then we have an object with flags to string all and value to string dot star. Alright, that works. So that's a quick demonstration of how I work in Haskell. If you have any questions, you can probably track down my email on my uh, GitHub account. GitHub account is bite my app. Have a good day.